Was it ill-advised to cut my own hair right before filming? Maybe, but sometimes you just have to jump into things without thinking, and this time, we're doing that with trolls. For those of you who are new here, I'm Niche and I make things, and right now I'm making an 80s themed orcs and goblins army for the old world. So I was traveling for a wedding, which means I only had five days to work on these trolls. Those of you in your 30s can relate. Wedding's always getting in the way of your goblin sculpting time. You get it. So even though this month has been crazy, I wanted to see if I could still get the three trolls done that I'd planned in that five days. The first two I wanted to make were kind of proof of concepts. I wanted to make a rock troll and a river troll. Trolls are awesome. The lore behind them is kind of nothing because they used to be a catch-all term for just monster, and they still kind of are. There's no real similarities between any troll besides the fact that they're big and stupid. Trolls are just kind of cooler giants who eat humans, mostly. So the base of my first troll is going to be this Reaper Mini. I bought this guy at Adepticon. Back then I didn't know I was going to be making a Warhammer army. I just really like trolls. It was like five bucks. It's made out of a cheap plastic that's easy to cut. And it's got a great shape that I knew would make a great base to some of my concepts. The second base was a gift from Trent. Trent converted this Mole as part of his Nurgle army. It was a little busted up and needed a foot, but the shape of it really screamed troll to me. I cut off the tentacles and the head and I'll for sure be using those later to make some weird mounts. But first things first, to help this guy stand, he needs a foot, so I gave him the hiccup treatment. Once all my trolls could stand on their own, I started with this slapdash kit bash technique. I needed these to come together really fast, so I didn't give myself much time to think. I find it hard to sculpt from nothing, so I found this hippo, I cut off its head, flipped it upside down, and used that as the base of my troll face. I went back and forth between these two models, working on both at the same time. This kept things interesting for my adhd as brain, but also gave things time to properly set and dry. So here are the concepts for my two trolls. For my first, I thought, what if instead of rock troll, crystal troll? Kind of a basic concept, but I had a cool idea for it. One day while looking for garbage, I found these purple resin crystals on the street along with some other discarded jewelry bits, and I've been waiting for a chance to use them. So I cut them up into a bunch of smaller sizes and just started gluing. I used hot glue for this because I ran out of super glue, but I think it helped fill in the gaps and looked really good. Hopefully this all stays together. I didn't cut any of these to a very specific shape and I didn't plan any of the placement. I just glued it if it looked good and I really liked the look of it. I re-sculpted this face like three times. I just didn't like the look of it. Then I decided Instead of trying to redefine what a troll could look like, I would just make it look like a classic troll. <laughs> Here is a dope tip. Sculpting teeth sucks. I find they never look as round or as sharp as I want them to, and it's just a pain in the butt to carve a bunch of really nice looking teeth. Since I was going for a classic troll look, I needed some gnarly looking tusks. So I went searching through my bits box and I found this. Warhammer bows make for great teeth. I just had to clean them up a bit and get rid of the mold lines. Is this a waste? Maybe? And I wouldn't do this all the time, but to get a really crisp good look, it is totally worth it and worth thinking about if you're sculpting something. Another tip is that the quality of glue matters. I went to my local game store looking for square bases. They didn't have any, but what they did have was Army Painter Super Glue. Turns out, glue meant for minis is better than the stuff you get at the dollar store. 
The cheap stuff will not hold things in place while things are drying, and has a weaker bond overall. So, yeah. If you're having trouble kit bashing, that's probably the problem, and it was for me and I wish someone had told me. <laughs> to finish off the rock troll, I wanted to make a real amethyst hammer. I'd made my partner a amethyst sword for, <laughs> for Halloween one year, and one of them fell off the pommel, and it's been sitting on my desk for forever. So I decided to use it for this project. So I had the hammer head, I just needed a handle. So my partner and I went on a goblin scavenging date looking for good sticks. She found a perfect stick. I had to modify it a little bit to make it work with the hammer, but I think the look is awesome. I could have sculpted this by hand, but I'm trying to save time here, and I think the look of an organic real stick is just cool. <laughs> So, back to the river troll. This thing needed arms, so I took the extra arms off the back of the WizKids Dire Troll and I added them to the Were Mole body. I wanted it to look a little more like the creature from the Black Lagoon, a little more swamp thing, so I went looking for fishy parts in my drawer of stuff. Trent had already sculpted a few barnacle looking shapes, so I decided to lean into that and see how aquatic I could make this river troll. Then I thought it would be fun if I made this guy look like an anglerfish. I know it's kind of a basic idea again, but it's just fun and they're so cool and scary. <laughs> The idea being that this troll lures in unsuspecting goblins into the water and then drags them down below the surface. So I left the antenna blank because I thought you could help me with what you think would lure a goblin into the water. What do you think should be on the end of this antenna? Let me know in the comments. Also subscribe if you're liking the video so far. So to fill the gaps, I used Milliput. Now, all they had was Milliput White, and I've never used it before. I've used standard Milliput before and I really liked it, but this stuff is really chalky and bad. I even tried mixing it with green stuff later, and that still sucked, so... Um, I don't know. Let me know if I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> to finish off the River Troll, I used the extra fingers to make little fish ears. This kind of worked. And I used an auric skirt to make a little fishy goatee. I really like the way this looks. And besides a little cleanup, these two trolls are done. One more to go. So like I said, I didn't have much time because I've been traveling. While back in my hometown, I got my very first tattoo. I've been wanting a tattoo for forever, but I just couldn't decide on what I wanted. Really, I was just overthinking it, which is something I do far too often. When I was at Adepticon, my friend Witty was getting a tattoo in a random hotel room on a whim, and I thought, man, I want to do that. And then it hit me, stop overthinking it, and just do it. So I asked my friend Scott if he would tattoo me while I was home. Scott was in the first D&D game I ever ran, and he also gave me my first ever Warhammer minis, which I still use as bandits and generic monsters in my D&D games. We've been making music and art together since we were 16. He's kind of my artistic other half, so it just felt right that he would do my first tattoo. I want to be braver in general, but in particular when it comes to making stuff. I overthink, I overplan, and things end up taking way longer than they need to. I want to make more things, I want to make more videos, it just feels like I'm too slow at everything. So what I need to do is just trust my instincts, dive into things, knowing that it's all gonna work out. This tattoo kind of represents that, but mostly it's just a little guy. One of the things I've been most excited to make for this army is my take on Trish Carden's Troll Hag. 
While traveling, I had none of my materials, so all I could really do was draw. So I drew a bunch of troll hag concepts. I know I just talked a big game about jumping into things and not over planning, but hear me out. I think there are artists out there that can just jump into things without a plan, and I think there are other artists that just pretend like they can. You don't typically get to see a lot of the behind the scenes planning process when it comes to making stuff. Partly because sometimes it's just really boring, and sometimes it happens in people's heads. I have aphantasia, which means I can't see things in my head, so when I make something, I have to plan it out physically. <laughs> sometimes I think my idea is really good, but when I go to plan it out, it doesn't work at all. Concept sketches are the key to developing good ideas. I say this mostly to remind myself that I need to do this more. If I don't plan things out, I end up fixing things and tweaking or just re-sculpting things. This wastes a lot of time. Sometimes jumping into a project means sketching and planning it out. I think the problem for me comes when things stay in the design phase for too long. The biggest difference to Trisha's original design is that I wanted to play a little bit more with the hag aesthetic. I wanted her to be hunched and bow-legged, but to do that, I'd need to make an armature. I hate making armatures. I almost always make a mistake that bites me in the ass later on, and it's the reason I mostly sculpt on top of stuff now. I don't have much advice when it comes to making armatures, but what I will say is make sure you spend the time to make a really interesting pose, and then just fuss around with it until you like it, but not for too long. We're trying to save time here. Just like everyone else, I bulk out my armature with some aluminum foil, and then I start sculpting with Sculpey. It has been a long time since I've gotten to use Sculpey, and it is really nice. So stress-free and easy to use. In returning to using Sculpey after almost a year, I notice that something is different. I feel like I'm actually thinking rather than stumbling into the right result. I went to art school, but I studied painting instead of sculpture, so I have a foundation of knowledge that I almost never use in the hobby. It kind of feels like I'm a sleeper agent with all this art knowledge that's just starting to resurface after years of doing this hobby. Anyway, here's a few lessons I learned while doing this sculpt. Keep your silhouette in mind. I heard this advice so much from illustration teachers and painting teachers and sculptors online, and it was annoying, but it is so true. <laughs> As I was trying to sculpt her body, she was feeling a little too balloony. I kept adding clay, but the more clay I added, the less fat she started to feel. So I studied Trisha's sculpt and realized it wasn't as round as I thought. The model feels heavy because it carries the weight where it needs to. If you look at Games Workshop and Warhammer models in general, very few of them will have thick arms or even big necks but a lot of them will have paunchy thick bellies. If you give a monster a big belly, it will feel fat even if the rest of it isn't particularly. For the same reason, this is why He-Man and Tarzan have such narrow waists, because if every part of him was thick and strong, none of him would look very strong. His arms wouldn't look as big. So with this model, I started cutting areas away with a knife, taking off a lot more than I thought I would, and what I ended up with was a much more satisfying silhouette. This did have the unintended result of making my model look a little more like Trish's than I intended, but it's kind of a perfect model, so I'm not mad about it. Something similar happened when I tried sculpting the face. The more wrinkles I added, the less old she seemed to look. So again, I looked at a reference. I wanted this model to have a real dark crystal feel to it, so I looked at pictures of Agra. Agra has deep cavernous lines in her face, which makes her feel really ancient, but if her entire face was as wrinkled as that, she wouldn't be as expressive or as iconic. You have to kind of pick and choose where you want these things to be. My last piece of advice is to let happy accidents turn into intentional choices. So often while making art, unexpected things will happen. I kind of learned to perfect this with oil painting. Oil paints are such a loose and expressive medium. Layers of paint will act in unexpected and delightful ways, but it's what you do after those unexpected things happen that make you a good painter. As I started sculpting the face, lines and shapes started to form that I didn't necessarily intend, but that looked really cool. 
Instead of leaving those areas as they were, I doubled down. I made them look more intentional. I would add clay to make it look more dramatic. I would blend those areas into lines I had already made. And this created some of my favorite parts of the face. I really leaned into the dark crystal aesthetic on this one. Her silhouette definitely gives Skeksis with the pointed nose. But I also worked in spiral shapes into her wrinkles as a reference to the mystics. I really like Monster Garden's magic system, where spirals and other shapes found in nature are greater conduits for magic. Maybe she carved these symbols into her own face, or maybe the repeated casting of a certain kind of magic over hundreds of years formed her wrinkles into this shape. I think showing a creature's connection to magic in a physical way is a really cool idea. I just love the way that Monster Garden incorporates lore into his design, and I wanted to do that with this build. The lore is why I love hags so much. I include hags in almost all of my D&D games, and I just concluded a hag coven arc that took almost two years to complete. In honor of that arc in my home game, there's a little reference to the final hag boss in this model. Here's a little snippet of a song that I wrote for that game. The final sis was fine and thin, her beauty was divine. She met a man with darkened skin who made her heart resign. The man she worshipped, loved, and kissed won't give his heart to she. This pain caused her to twist, her features came gnarled as a tree. I wanted the troll's face to be so gnarled, it literally begins turning into a tree. I blended this with the idea of a one-eyed witch, and I think the result is really awesome. Also in my world, hags were once human, and the idea of a creature that looks like this once being human is really interesting to me. So here's what I came up with for lore for this creature. Long before the Great Goblin era, there was a human witch, a twisted, selfish woman who committed unspeakable deeds. In order to prolong her life, she consumed the hearts of other humans. In committing such an inhuman act, she began to lose her humanity. Her monstrous deeds turned her more monster-like with every passing year. The magic she performed was also an abomination, a mockery of nature, and in exchange, she paid nature's toll. Eventually, she forgot why she fed on humans. She forgot her name. Her mind became simple, driven only by hunger and greed. The finesse of a magic she spent lifetimes perfecting has long been forgotten. All that remains is a magic most primitive and most dangerous. This is the best sculpt I've ever done, hands down. It's also probably one of my favorite things I've ever made, but low-key I kind of feel that way every time I make a new project. <laughs> I feel like I'm really improving, and on top of that, the sculpt only took like four days to make, which is faster than I've ever made anything. I think it took me three or four weeks to finish the Goblin King that I made almost two years ago. I still really like the sculpt, but I think sometimes improvement can be seen through speed rather than just the finished product. I really like how stylistically the two feel like they belong together. I feel like that means like I'm developing a concrete style. Sometimes it's hard to see your own style, but I feel like I'm starting to see it. Also seeing the army come together is really satisfying and really getting me excited about future builds. I think next time we're going to be making some goblins, so subscribe if you want to stick around for that. Again, let me know in the comments what kind of orcs and goblins you want to see me make. Character ideas, war bands. My patrons already started giving me some really fun ideas that I'm really excited to make. Also, someone asked where they can listen to the music featured in my videos. I never mentioned this, but I do write all the music for my videos, so I'm going to throw all of that on Bandcamp. Also, if you want me to record the full-length version of the song I sang in this video, as well as all the other shanties and narrative songs I've written for my D&D games, let me know. Also, as I was recording the voice for this video, something cool happened. That's me. <laughs> That's me. That's also me. I'm...
in a miscast video. Also, this is proof that Trent and I did meet because we didn't take any pictures together. <laughs> Anyways, that's it. Uh, see you next time. Bye!